we've got some time for uh, questions that we'd love for you guys to respond to. And uh, what we'd like to add, too, if, uh, if you have one question for each other at the end, based on what uh, the responses that you'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hitchens or you'd like to ask Dr. Dembski, uh, we'll save time for that as well. The first question, uh, and these are for both of you to respond to. Um, obviously, they're kind of pointed towards one person or the other. Uh, but the first one is uh, for uh, Mr. Hitchens. Um, Using the evolutionary process, where do you, and, and you answered this a little bit, but if you could expound on it, um, where does the concept of human thought and the ability to reason come in, especially in dealing with things that would seem to go against um, the, uh, the evolutionary concept? Um, the idea you mentioned before was self-sacrifice. Why would there continue to be something like self-sacrifice if that's not going to um, you know, continue to move on to species? So where does that idea, the ability to reason, come from using evolution? Well, it seems, I think the question may be confusing the idea of reasoning with the idea of self-sacrifice, which isn't necessarily an irrational one. Um, my favorite example, I think, would be um, because we do, we do, we do need a, a, an explanation, or it would be nice to have one. It's a good speculation. Why do people get pleasure from doing things that aren't necessarily in their interest, just for the sake of other people? I hope no one in this room hasn't had that feeling at a certain point. Um, and it's, it's very nice that we have it along with all our predatory and selfish and other survival necessary attributes. I think my favorite example is that of giving blood. Um, I like giving blood. Um, I like the feeling that I'm giving someone else a life-giving fluid. I am giving it. Uh, I'm also not losing it. It doesn't take very long to replenish a pint of blood. So it's, it's a really wonderful gift relationship to have. You haven't lost a pint, but you've given one. Um, so there's no need for any sort of feel good or self congratulation about it. You haven't really made a big sacrifice, but you've taken a little time. You've thought about other people. And then I have a very, very rare blood group. Um, and I'm very anxious that there'll be enough blood when it's my turn. So there's every interest in the good feeling that I have, the warm feeling that I have, being one that evolution has given me for my sake and for everybody else's. I don't think there's anything very mysterious about that, do you? Apparently not. OK. <laughs> it, doesn't require, it doesn't require that I have a divine spark. It doesn't require any design. It doesn't require any programming. And I'm perfectly aware of the fact that a lot of people don't do it. Don't. And of course, there are a lot of people who, are, who don't care about others at all. We call them sociopaths. And the design apparently also makes quite a lot of psychopaths, people who can only be happy, making other people unhappy. These are all children of God as well, according to you. It's not my problem. That's exactly what you would expect from the imperfectly evolved primate species. No mysteries there. Nothing to explain, nothing to call on God about. Why did you allow Hitler? We know where Hitler comes from. There's no, don't, a real, a, a, the principle of Occam's razor in, in logic and philosophy, keep it by you at all times. Don't make mysteries where none exist. Don't increase the number of unnecessary and complex questions. Very important principle. It's death to religion, that principle. Would you like to respond to that as well? Maybe just, uh follow up. I mean, it's, it's certainly a big theme both here and in uh, Christopher Hitchens' book, this idea of bonding that, that evolution has uh, given us some sort of group solidarity, makes us bond, and that this, uh, that this helps preserve the, the species. So, it's, uh, uh, so it all kind of matches up. And you know, I, think, I think there's, uh, you can get that from evolution. I, I don't think you need to get it exclusively from evolution. I think certainly one can argue on basis of design that God has designed us to be social creatures. But the thing is, if you're going to take the bonding from evolution, it seems that there are lots of other things that you can take as well. I mean, uh, Darwin referred to evolution, the evolutionary process, as the great battle for life. And some people have taken it in a very uh, negative and violent way. Uh, there were uh, two authors uh, recently that wrote a book on the evolutionary history of rape and argued 
that rape is an evolutionary adaptation. Uh, you have somebody like uh, Steven Pinker writing, I think it was in the New York Review of Books or New York Times Magazine about 11 years ago, justifying infanticide because uh, in our hunter-gatherer past, uh, mothers would sometimes kill their infants during times of drought so that they would have more resources, could keep themselves alive so that when uh, uh, the drought was passed and then times of abundance came back, then she could get pregnant again, have a child, and then rear it properly. Uh, and so this was, why did Steven Pinker write this? Because there had been this prom mom, a girl who had gone to a prom, delivered a child, and killed it there. So the thing is, evolution is a very mixed bag. You can get some, you can argue for some good things out of it, uh, you know, and you can look at the animal world and you'll see some, some very nice fuzzy things that uh, behave very nicely to each other, and then you'll see some very wicked things. And I think this was actually the problem for Darwin. Uh, if you read, I mean, he cut his teeth on William Paley's natural theology. The longest chapter in William Paley's natural theology is the second to the last one, in which he's trying to justify the evils in nature. And he tries to really minimize it. He poo poos it. He says, well, uh, yes, organisms kill each other and they die, but it really happens very quickly and there's not much pain. Darwin takes his voyage on the Beagle, looks at the natural world, and he sees a world of parasites and nastiness. And he says, how could this be? How could a good God design something like this? And you see this mixed bag in nature. Uh, and, uh, and this is actually, I think, a, a challenge for design to make sense of also the nasties. But the thing is, it's a challenge for design, but it's not a refutation of design because we can determine whether something is designed uh, independent of the morality or goodness or optimality of the design. So the issues run very deep, and we're not going to really be able to resolve them here, but I, I do want to give you some sense that, uh, that there is a discussion here and there's some interesting issues and things are also not that pat in terms of trying to understand bonding and the, the good, the feel-good things in our uh, morality and our being simply on the basis of evolution. It's a mixed bag. Whereas, whereas only a few verses away, only a few verses later than the Ten Commandments, uh, God instructs the children of Israel to kill everyone of the other tribe, the Amalekites, the Midianites, everybody, all the men, all the children, and to leave only the marriageable women alive. That's a, that is, um, and it's a re an instruction that's very frequently repeated, by the way, and invariably carried out. Um, when Thomas Paine pointed that out in the Age of Reason a couple of centuries ago, it was a Welsh bishop who wrote in, complaining to him, saying, the Bible does not say those women were kept for immoral purposes. <laughs> you're free to believe that if you wish. But if you're going to bring up rape and evolution and the way that humanity actually behaves, under divine instruction, I'm pointing out here, you must stop saying what I meant to correct you from saying earlier, that what I attack is what people do in the name of religion. No, they don't mistake religion when they obey commandments like this. What I object to is what's in the original instructions. And these are instructions for rape, genocide, and slavery. They are instruction manuals for it. And also, how to behave like a slave yourself. Just to come. I, I want to be careful here because, I mean, the, the topic of the debate was the existence and goodness of God. I mean, we, we weren't talking about Christian theism, but I mean, I think uh, here we are at obviously a, a Christian church. So let's talk a little bit about this. I mean, certainly if we're going to do this, we have to get into a little bit of Christian theology. One thing that's very clear is that in Christian theology is that this is a broken, fallen world. And in a broken, fallen world, there are often no good, no optimal solutions. And I think we can see this uh, in, even in human contexts. Uh, the dropping of the A-bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, difficult decision. Do we do it? We did it. Uh, not to do it means, meant probably losing hundreds of thousands of American lives. Uh, so there was, there was the, the, the problem is that in a fallen world, there is no perfect optimization strategy. And it seems to me that God, in dealing with a fallen world, is often confronted with uh, a, uh, uh, trying to get the, the, the best of some bad options. Uh, and I think one thing, you know, the, it's funny that the, the Amalekites keep coming up. The Jews decimated or 
annihilated them. Uh, but the thing is, the Jews also turned against themselves. They probably fought as much against themselves as they fought against other people, and sometimes in, in divine judgment. Uh, when the, the concubine and judges uh, was dismembered uh, because of this, uh, the, the, the Benjamites, Benjaminites, uh, the, the, almost the entire tribe of Benjamin was destroyed. Uh, God is a just God, and in a sense, he's not bound by the same rules that we are. He makes the rules, and uh, the fact is we all die, and this is, uh, this is a decision by God. I mean, the, the, the way the world is structured, why do we have this death? Why is it a broken and fallen world? Ultimately, Christian the theology teaches that this is a, as a result of human rebellion against God. So you've got this whole system of theology. Now, Christopher Hitchens looks at that, he's aware of it, and you know, he's not going to have a part of it, but there is the whole system that, that you, that, that comes to you, and it does, the alternatives, it seems, uh, if you're not going to go with a theistic position, a Christian theistic position, or some other position, maybe you don't find that one, right, then it seems that you're confronted that with an atheistic position, which has its own problems. I think uh, the indignation and that, that Christopher Hitchens feels. And, you know, the thing is, I applaud probably 80, 90% of his book, the, 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 the hypocrisies, the problems that he finds. Uh, you know, no question about that. But on what basis does he do that? And I don't think he can do it on an atheist. I think often one gets the sense that, you know, he, he comes in, it's hit and run, all these faults that he can find, problems that he can find with religion. But he has an atheistic worldview, and that has problems of itself. In a fallen world, no worldview is going to be perfect. It's not going to cover things. I mean, that's, 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 that's the problem. And so we do have a problem of evil. We have a problem with good. We have lots of problems. <laughs> we, we can either go back to questions or you can continue on. Do you, do you have a response to that? Well, in an evolutionary mammalian world, also quite obviously, there is no perfect solution either, as I've said. That's, uh, that, that would, I hardly need to say it once you've described that that's what we are, imperfectly evolved mammals on a short-lived planet. Um, people now object to that, though it's true, and there's all the evidence is in its favor. We are poorly evolved mammals on a short-lived, rather endangered planet. Um, people say, well, if you believe that, that's depressing, nihilistic, uh, makes things seem so random and capricious and so on. Well, yes, but is it true or not? And what is true of your view? What is true of your view, sir? Well, you've just said that God invents, makes a human species, takes a brief look at it and decides, it's in rebellion against me. It doesn't know how it's done this, but that's his verdict. You're in rebellion against me. For one thing, you've broken the rule I gave you, don't think for yourselves. You, de you deliberately went and looked for knowledge. Now you're in rebellion. Now you're gonna suffer. Now there's nothing that won't happen to you. I made you and I can break you. And I will. I'll flood you, I'll plague you. Now, what is this? This is like being a terrible insect or rodent in the, in the laboratory of a cruel and stupid person. And what could be more, what is more nihilistic? What's more nihilistic and alienating than that? It's all summarized in one line, if you wish. To believe what Dr. Dembski believes and his co-thinkers believe, you have to consider yourself created incurably sick and then ordered on pain of death and eternal torture to be well. This is not morality. We, actually, the, the first question that was asked is the most important question. We could do this question only, couldn't we? But I think we probably should have another one. Yes. Dr. Dempsey, would you like to respond before we move on to another question, or we'll save that for the closing? Well, I think, again, we have, the, the, there's a mirror that's, that's at play here. I mean, what poisons everything? Is it religion? I would say, get a mirror and look at it. We all poison everything. Uh, we're sick, yes. Uh, but I would say not incurably so. In fact, uh, the, the cure is there. Uh, according to Christianity, in Jesus Christ. So it's, uh, so it's not, uh, 
And it's interesting. I mean, in a lot of these discussions, Christopher has not brought, brought this up, but I mean, he has a real problem with the vicarious atonement, as he calls it, or substitutionary uh, view of the atonement. Uh, but what, what's interesting, it seems, it seems that he always omits that in God becoming human in Jesus Christ, that God has established solidarity with the human condition. Uh, this was actually, in my own conversion, the thing that was the turning point. I mean, I was raised in a largely secular home, a biologist father who taught evolutionary biology. And so none of these issues were issues for me, really, the science faith stuff. Uh, what was crucial for me was, did God know what was I, I was going through? Did he have knowledge not just of description as this potentate, as this capricious dictator, which you always refer to off there, but did he know what I was going through in the moment, the, the pain and suffering that I was experiencing, uh, and the fact that Christ had become human. You see, I, I was raised a Roman Catholic. I had no belief that Jesus was God. I remember sitting back at, yeah, I went to a Catholic prep school, six days of school a week, studied Latin and Greek, uh, went to, uh, went to, I remember going to church, and because uh, I was forced to go to church, and the Catholic priest saying, you cannot be a Christian unless you believe that Jesus was God. And I remember consciously thinking, I don't believe this, you know? And when I was uh, started at the University of Chicago at age 16, I was asked what my religious preference was. I put down Hindu, because I was, a, I was basically a new age guy. That's, that's, that's what I was thinking. But none of those, none of that, uh, the, the, the sense I always had that was God was distant and at best he knew what I was dealing with by description, by knowing, by kind of reading a book out of it, by looking from his heaven and seeing what, I was, seeing what I was going through from a distance. Missionaries who live in glass houses uh, are not very impressive. Missionaries who go and live with the people and suffer with them, those are the ones who are impressive. Jesus came and lived with us and not just lived with us, but suffered an excruciating death. Excruciating, I mean, that's a word that comes from crucifixion. It was a word invented because of the pain he went through. So he knows everything that the humans are going through. And that's why he can be a mediator. You know, I mean, from your leftist background, Christopher, you, you know, I mean, the importance of solidarity. And that's what God established with us uh, through Christ coming and through the cross. And so, you know, for you to dismiss you know, the, the atonement at one man, God making union, it's, it's not a capricious dictator. Uh, the, the fact is, dictators go, you know, they capture a country by subversion, by coercion. God owns everything. He created everything. He's the source of all being. And it's not going to be a North Korea in which we uh, you know, are forced to worship God. That's not, the, the, the thing is, I mean, the, he's the creator of everything. So, I mean, wouldn't you want to visit with Shakespeare if you could get a chance? Well, what about visiting with the one who created Shakespeare? I mean, th there's going to be no uh, boredom in heaven because we're dealing, I mean, if, if the earth is exciting, how much more exciting is the one who created everything? So this is the Christian perspective. I think, yeah, you, there, there is harshness there in the scriptures. There are Malachites and a lot of things. But what would you like? Would you like a sanitized Bible in which there was nothing like this in which we eliminated all of this because all the carnage that we see in the scripture is there today and it's done in the name of religion and it's done in the name of secular atheistic principles as well you know what poisons everything we do okay yeah we do because we're created sick but um i mean look as some of you may or may not know <clears throat> in the early uh, christian years there were many um leaders of the early church who thought that Christianity should be a new religion, um, which it's not, unfortunately, for you. And the, the, other, the reason it'll never triumph um, is because it insists on shackling itself to the terrible books of the Jewish Old Testament. Now, great Christian thinkers like Mar Marcion was the best known. There were Marcionite churches all over the, the M Middle East just for the study and worship of the, me the message of the Nazarene. But it was decided no. The whole Nazarene story had to prove, had to reverse engineer and prove the truth of the Old Testament books as well. And with this insufferable burden, you've saddled yourself with an unbelievable and wicked religion. Um, it's a pity, I sometimes think. But I think there are different, the pure Christian religion too, and he mentioned the name I give to one of them, uh, a doctrine that I think is strictly immoral, the idea of vicarious redemption. 
Now, though I say I don't think there's any historical definite proof of this person's existence, because all the accounts of him are so discrepant, there are so many of them that it's enough to persuade me that there must have been some such figure. And it's not that unlikely that there'd be a charismatic rabbi wandering in a region that was hungry for messiahs and kept on hoping to find them. It's not at all unlikely that there was one or that he would have got in trouble with the Romans and been, as people were who get in trouble with the Romans, very harshly treated. This does not prove, it doesn't even suggest that his birth was divine or that his father was God or that his mother was a virgin. None of these things are remotely provable. They're not even really arguable. They can only be asserted. But suppose they are. I then have to be told that the torture and human sacrifice of somebody, which if I'd been present, it would have been my duty to try and prevent, which I did not ask for, which I, over which I have no control, that took place thousands of years, according to some, before I was born, commits me, and I have no choice in the matter, and that my sins are forgiven by this human sacrifice. Now, what's wrong with that? If I like you enough or love you enough, I can pay your debt. I say there was folly on your part, but I'll pay it for you. In extreme cases, people have been known to volunteer to take other people's place in prison, or even, one or two very famous cases, on the scaffold. They'll say, I'll do that for you. I'll do it for love, or I'll do it for suffering humanity. But that's the most they can do. And it's not bad. What they can't do is take away your sins, because that would be to take away your responsibility. I can't say you didn't steal or lose that money that I'm having to pay now. I can't say that this course of folly didn't get you into prison. It did, and now look what you're do doing to me. I can't relieve you of that. I can't wash you white as snow and make you new again. It's more than can be promised and more than should be promised. Vicarious redemption is scapegoating. It's throwing your sins onto an animal. It's an old primitive practice from the Middle East. It doesn't deserve the attention of civilized or thoughtful people. So anyway, it's power. Let's admit, it's kindly offered to me. I give all these objections. I think it's highly implausible. I don't really believe the story. Um, I didn't ask for it. And having considered it, I would rather carry on living, trying to lead, lead a decent life without it. OK, thanks. But thanks for asking. Oh, no, sorry. You didn't hear us right the first time. It wasn't an offer. You refuse it on pain of death. <clears throat> Excuse me, I won't be talked to in that tone of voice. <laughs> something about me. I hope something about some of you too. What was that? I'm not free to refuse this offer. You're making me an offer I can't decline. Was that a threat? Are you saying that if I turn away from this, this lamb's blood, uh, from which I'm supposed to be washed, and say, I don't think it will clean me, Say, so, well, that means an eternity of torture, you know. I hope you, you better take that into account before you uh, consider our offer of eternal love. No, no, no. This is North Korea. This is celestial dictatorship. This is a, the worship that only a slave could take part in. I'm, I'm happy to respond to this. I think we've, we've only gone through one one question so far, but let, let me just say this, that you refuse this on pain of death. According to scripture, we're dead already in trespasses of sins. So the only way we're going to find life, I am the resurrection and the life, he that cometh to me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That is God's offer of life. And I'm, it's remarkable to me that you identify sins with responsibility. I mean, the, the penal substitution or vicarious atonement, what is it saying? I mean, it's really saying that there is a moral law that all debts must be paid. And that's when you give the examples of, and, and of the uh, person who pays your debt, who serves the prison sentence for you, who dies the death that you deserve, that is what is at stake. That's what, what it means to be forgiven. It means that that debt is paid and that God will not hold you accountable for it because the debt has been paid. Jesus paid the debt. I'm not sure, you know, to bring in responsibility, of course, you did it. And God remembers that you did it, but he's not going to hold it against you. So I'm, and, but the thing is, you know, on atheist principles, what do you mean by responsibility? I mean, you talk to many uh, Darwinists, you're a Darwinist, uh, they will say free will is dead. I mean, something like uh, Will Provine at uh, Cornell 
Uh, I mean, free will. I mean, in fact, it's, it's good that free will is gone because then you can't punish people for doing things that they were conditioned to do anyway. But the thing is, if you don't have responsibility, if, if, you, if you don't have free will, you don't have responsibility. Responsibility is the ability to respond, to do differently. And on atheist principles, you don't have responsibility. So look, I mean, I feel the pressure and the things that you bring up, and I think it, maybe it would be nice if we could just sit around and talk about these things at, at length sometime. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not entirely comfortable with all the theology. You know, I tell my, my, my students at the seminary, the Bible is not a book of systematic theology. You know, it's nice to have it all laid out and everything is in its neat place. It's, it's messy, and the world is messy, but it captures that messiness. And I think it offers hope and it offers truth, and I find it does a better job than an atheistic worldview. Does it do a perfect job? No. I wish it did a better job. Hell. I'm not real comfortable with that. Um, the exclusive exclusivity of Jesus Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way. Um, you know, I wish sometimes that, uh, you know, that it wasn't quite that harsh a truth. But, you know, that's the thing is, I think with worldviews, often we're stuck with package deals. And I accept it. Uh, but I think we... There, there are tensions that we all deal with, and I, I hope you, you find them in your atheistic worldview, because I don't think it's all neat and pat. And I think in these debates, we sometimes have to pretend that we've got it all down, and I don't think any of us do, really. Please. I, I really think we ought to get, accommodate another question. Please. Good, a number of the questions actually dealt with um, uh, an area dealing with evolution, um, and sort of the beginning, the, the uh, the concept of uh, what happens before the Big Bang. Where did uh, matter come from? Um, how did we get that? And, uh, and so if you could sort of respond to that from that concept, and, and actually if uh, Dr. Dembski, in, in, you know, in talking about that same concept um, in dealing with uh, intelligent design, right, where, where are the gaps within the species um, that you've found, right, you know, those species that are, are in between that sort of give a a problem to the intelligent design concept that sort of demonstrate evolution. Oh, oh, so less, less than three or four minutes. Uh, yeah, we, we, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think uh, you know, Christian theology has certainly taught that, uh, that God created the world from nothing. Nothing in the sense that there was no pre-existing matter, that there's no principle outside God that, that is equally uh, eternal. Uh, and that, that seems to be uh, mirrored in, in the Big Bang because it seems that our physical laws, if we look at the observable universe, not the speculated multiverse, but if we look at the, the observable uh, known physical universe, it seems that when we trace back in time, we get back to some singularity, some point at which we can't push the laws of physics, can't run the, the clocks back any further. So that suggests the beginning. And this was actually a very big issue within the scientific community 30, 40, 50 years ago because when the Big Bang really seemed to be alive and, and the, the way to go in, uh, in our understanding of fuzz, fundamental cosmology, uh, there was the sense that, uh, that, that it opened the door to theism because the, the previous view had been a steady state view in which basically matter, the universe, everything was eternal and uh, there was, uh, had, had basically been unchanged uh, since eternity. So it was a big challenge. Now I think uh, there are lots of moves these days to try to uh, monkey with the cosmology to get a bigger world, a multiverse, but basically that's a way of I think trying to trying to get by the theistic uh, implications of Big Bang cosmology. Uh, with regard to evolution, I don't know, I mean uh, that, that's, that's just a huge topic. I mean the, the continuity and the fossil record uh, I think the uh, I think there's a fair amount of uh, common ancestry, but I, I'm certainly not uh, an advocate of uh, universal common ancestry. I just don't think the fossil record bears that out. I think the Cambrian explosion is a, is a perfect example where you have just uh, utter you, you have these these forms which are just there, poof, and there are no precursors. And you might say, well, maybe fossilization just wasn't all that good and we missed it. But the thing is, we, we can tell how good fossilization is by looking at extant organisms and seeing how well they're fossilized. And it turns out when you go to higher levels of classifications, families, orders, classes, 
uh, actually fossilization percentages are very good. So they should be there. And we see also microorganisms, soft body plans in the Precambrian rocks. So it seems to me that uh, the, uh, uh, you know, if you're going to try to push for common descent, you're not getting it from the full common, common descent, the monad to man evolution. Uh, I don't think you're, the, 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 the evidence supports that. Mr. Hitchens. Uh, Stephen Hawking's latest book on the, <clears throat> the Big Bang, the first one in which he actually says explicitly that it, it all works without God, in fact, works better without the idea of a, of a creator, contains a, a statement with which I hugely want to disagree. He says that these latest discoveries in physics <clears throat> are also the death of philosophy. Now, I don't want that to be true because I'm not a scientist and I revere philosophy. Uh, but what he means by it is this. There was a time when a philosopher, a natural philosopher, someone like uh, Newton um, or Kant, um, could speculate about the natural world. That's why they were called natural scientists as well. And do better <clears throat> than many professionals could. For example, it was Kant sitting in a room in Königsberg after the Lisbon earthquake when people for the first time began to doubt that earthquakes were caused by God or were judgments. This is only in the 18th century people began for the first time to wonder if these were verdicts as the Christians had been telling them. Didn't seem to work anymore. Kant proposed the idea, it, said it may seem fanciful, but perhaps there are underground caverns, some of them even below the sea, which sometimes cave in and lead to what he didn't call seismic events because we didn't have a word for seismology then. But there were philosophers could do scientific work by speculating on the natural world and using their heads, uh, as Lucretius could with the atoms. What Hawking means to say is this. We now may be beyond the point where you can say anything useful unless you are, in fact, a member of a certain scientific discipline. I really hope this isn't true for selfish reasons, but you have to take this thought very seriously. Now, Lawrence Krauss, who I think is one of the greatest living physicists, has a, a lecture which you can go to YouTube and have a look at. Called, it's called A Whole Universe from Nothing. He explains how it is, how with the, what we now know about the quantum, which is perilously little, by the way, so far, but what we know about it, can claim to know, suggests that actually nothing from nothing isn't as much of a contradiction as it may seem. And that's about the origins of the matter. <clears throat> I recommend that to you. I, my only f philosophical contribution, if you like, would be towards the end of the question, which is a little easier, I think. Whether we came from nothing or not, we are certainly headed for it or it is headed for us. You may choose to believe that this tiny speck of a planet in a, in a bang which blows out a million sun, a, a sun every second, sorry, a whole sun every second and has done for 10 billion years, that all that happened so that we could be meeting here today, you can choose to believe that if you want to. It's just, it's not even disproportionate. It's, it's, it's simply refusing to use the new language and the new evidence as if they meant anything at all. But suppose that to be true if you wish, if you must. If you look in the sky, you can actually see the Andromeda galaxy heading towards us now. We know, physicists can tell you, the date on which our galaxy will collide with Andromeda. It's actually, it can be seen with the naked eye, the future. It's over. We don't know whether that will happen first or whether our sun will join the billions of suns that have blown up or whether <clears throat> now that we've discovered, discovered that Edwin Hubble's red light shift showing the speed and rate of the expansion of the universe, the way in, in which it's flying apart, that as I said earlier, that speed and rate, this was only found out a decade ago, is increasing all the time, completely contradicting everything we thought before. We're flying apart faster than we thought. A lot of nothingness is coming our way. Now, what design is that a part of, is what you have to ask yourself. Of what design, let alone of what benign design, could that conceivably be a part? This fantastic waste of energy, this gigantic profusion. Again, it makes God such a tinkerer and such a profligate, just as 99.8% of every species created 
on earth since it started has been dispensed with, has gone extinct, has been surplus to requirements. What a waste, what a, what a profusion, what a cruelty if you want to give it a human or a spirited name. Ah, that's what you have to believe. That's the kind of tinkerer, the kind of capricious, uh, incompetent tyrant, obviously so much modeled on our human experience of authority. And that as, as it's enough to convince me of what I'm now sure of. Man did not create God. Men and women created many, many, many gods and always have since the dawn of our history and still do. And one of those gods may be true, out of all of them, might be real, or all of them could be false, or all of them could be true. And the overwhelming probability, it seems to me, as the cults that attach to each other, is that all of them are false and for the same reason. They are made up by creatures half a chromosome away from being chimpanzees, and I'm afraid to say it shows. Thank you. Can I respond? But we have to move on. I, I know we could, uh, we could uh, continue uh, to go back and forth for quite a while, and I appreciate you guys. Um, as opposed to getting to all the questions, you actually answered a lot of the questions that we had uh, just by going back and forth. So we're going we're gonna to actually end up uh, closing with just our final statements, uh, five-minute final statements. And uh, no, agreement. I, I don't. I mean, I haven't thought of it till now. I'd rather have another question than summarize what I've already said. Would you like to ask each other a question? I'd rather give the audience, I mean, I feel we shortchanged the, uh, but you may want to do your closing one, and I've, I don't blame I've you. got my closer, I mean, I've, I have a prepared text, and I'm hoping it's going to be a zinger, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess in the, in the sake of the interest of, uh, of the people and the audience that we have here, I know many of the schools um, are going to have to get back. We'll, uh, we'll simply, um, I, I will say that out of the questions that we did have, you did answer a number of the questions, even though we didn't get to verbalize them specifically. So, uh, Mr. Hitchens, if you'd like to have five minutes for closing. Not really. I'd rather have a question. Fantastic. <laughs> I might take five minutes to answer it, but I'd rather, I feel more, I feel suddenly combative and engaged. <laughs> How about this? If you don't think I can talk for five minutes at the drop of a hat, by the way, you mistake me. Yeah. I can We'll, we'll allow Dr. Dembski to have five minutes, and okay. if there's anything you'd like to respond to in that, if there's a question, maybe that'll raised. give me some. <laughs> Fantastic, Dr. Dembski. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that the the old Christopher Hitchens seems back in, in fighting form. So this is this is good. Um, Got to keep things interesting. Okay. Well, let me uh, give you my closing statement. Uh, in Alexander Schmemann's critique of secularism. He remarked, quote, it is not the immorality of the crimes of man that reveal him as a fallen being. It is his positive ideal, religious or secular, and his satisfaction with this ideal. Let me read that again. It is not the immorality of the crimes of man that reveal him as a fallen being. It is his positive ideal, religious or secular, and his satisfaction with this ideal, close quote. A common criminal knows that he is a criminal and doesn't try to rationalize his crimes or cast himself as a benefactor of humanity. But an ideologue who knows what's best for humanity and cannot find satisfaction until everyone is on board with his positive ideal, with his ideology, such a man can rationalize anything and is truly dangerous. Schmemann's insight captures what's right and what's wrong with Christopher Hitchens' case against religion. Religion can be a problem, yes. Religious people confident that theirs is the only way to build a better world have felt it their moral duty to coerce, torture, and kill others. Hitchens sees this clearly, but secularism can be as guilty as religion in this respect. Secularists confident that theirs is the only way to build a better world have likewise felt it their moral duty to coerce, torture, and kill others. Nevertheless, Hitchens refuses to admit any parity between religious and secular evil. Recount atrocities committed by religious people and Hitchens is delighted, yet another nail in the coffin of religion. But mention a person, community, or movement whose atrocities flow from their secular ideals and Hitchens changes the subject. And to what subject does he change it? Why, to religion, of course. For instance, mention Stalin and the millions he killed and Hitchens will tell you how Stalin started out as a seminarian for the Orthodox priesthood and how Russian Orthodox believers presently make icons of Stalin, complete with halos. 
Mention the Nazis, the Holocaust, and Hitler. Hitler, by the way, likened Christianity to smallpox. And Hitchens will regale you with how many SS were churchgoers. Mention North Korea and its crazy communist dictators, and Hitchens will inform you that the North Korea is the closest thing he can imagine to the Christian heaven, complete with a holy trinity comprising Kim this, Kim that, and Kim something else. Uh, changing the subject in this way, however, doesn't change the fact that secularism can be just as ideologically driven as religion. The irony is that Hitchens' own atheist crusade is itself ideologically driven. The subtitle of Hitchens' book reads, How Religion Poisons Everything. Gripped by the idea that religion poisons everything, he cannot allow that religious people, precisely because of their religion, might do good. Hitchens takes this idea to ridiculous extremes in his attack on Mother Teresa. In his 1994 BBC documentary, Hell's Angel, his 1995 book, The Missionary Position, and briefly, in God is Not Great, Hitchens portrays her as a self-serving hypocrite. In the audience today is my good friend, Mary Poplin, a professor at Claremont. She was in Calcutta with Mother Teresa when Hitchens came out with his book against her. Recently, Poplin published Finding Calcutta, in which she recounts her time with Mother Teresa. Poplin writes, quote, and Poplin and the nuns there were reading your, your book while she was there. Hitchens also accused Mother Teresa of receiving the best in health care when it was not available to the poor. However, I took an offer to her from a colleague's brother who was involved in developing a new pacemaker to replace her old pacemaker with new, a new and improved one. She said she could not accept it, but she would accept it for the poor. She also refused another medical offer. When I called and repeated these offers upon her becoming more ill a few months after I left, and that was close to her death, she again refused and asked for prayers instead. My impression is that she mostly received good health care when she was too ill to fight it. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it there rather abruptly. I think in my rhetoric course, I, I would wrap things up. But um, uh, I'm going to give Mother Teresa the last word. So that's where I'll leave it. <laughs> oh, well. Well, Mother Teresa was a fanatic, um, a fundamentalist, and a fraud. She was not a friend of the poor, as she claimed to be. She was a friend of poverty. Preached it as a, as a good thing, as a gift from God, something to be welcomed along with other kinds of suffering. Wasn't interested in alleviating it. Was a friend of the rich. Took money from the Duvalier family in Haiti, one of the most obscenely bloated uh, dynastic dictatorships in history. Uh, took money from Charles Keating, the man who robbed Americans blind through the Lincoln Savings and Loan. Stolen money. Um, all to build convents in her own name, uh, more than 200 of them around the world, in order to found an order that bear, bore her name. This is not modesty either, nor is it humility. It doesn't exhaust my critique of her either. Um, we all know there is a cure for poverty. It's a rudimentary one. It does work, though. It works everywhere for the same reason. It's colloquially called the empowerment of women. It's the only thing that does work. If you allow women control over, some control over their cycle of reproduction so that they're not chained by their husbands or by village custom to annual animal type pregnancies, early death, disease, and so on. If you will free them from that, give them some basic uh, health of that sort, and if you are generous enough to throw in perhaps a handful of seeds and a bit of credit, the whole floor, culturally, socially, medically, uh, economic of that village will rise. It works every time. Mother Teresa spent her entire life campaigning against that outcome. She said that contraception was equivalent to abortion morally, and abortion was morally equivalent to murder. She was entirely against the only thing that cures poverty. I would say that her preachments led to an enormous increase in the amount of poverty, ignorance, filth, and disease in the world. And I would further add, without embarrassment, that it's off those things that the Roman Catholic Church has always fed and made its living. Otherwise, there'd be no need for the Protestant Revolution, which brings us here today. Um, and believe me, I've, I've barely started with, uh, with that terrible person. Now, 
as I said before, you can be an atheist in anything you like. You can be an atheist in the Marquis de Sade. You can be an atheist and be uh, a great humanist. I mean, most of the uh, missionary work, people d work done by Médecins Sans Frontier, for example, by Oxfam, by many other people in the stricken parts of the globe, which I've visited, done by people who are not doing it to proselytize for their faith. They're not doing it uh, handing out Bibles surreptitiously. They're not doing it for any, for any such reason. They're doing it for its own sake. That's a, that's a beautiful humanism, and I admire it. I even think it has a slight superiority and there's no hidden agenda to it. But I'm not going to have Nazism called secularism, if you don't mind. Uh, it, I'm a prisoner of what I know here. I know too much about it. I've read Mein Kampf, for example, which most people have not, where Hitler says several times, starting very early on, that he's doing God's work in extermi exterminating the Jews. He went on saying that. The Vatican was shown the book. In those days, they would ban any book they didn't like the look of. They were one of the great book banning organizations in the world. They didn't ban the book that was written by the leader who made his first political treaty in Germany with them and their church and outside Germany between his dictatorship and the Vatican. If you wanted to take your oath, well, you didn't have to want to, you had to, if you were in the German army or in the SS, to take your oath to the Fuhrer, which was compulsory, you took it like this, I swear by almighty God, undying fealty. Around your belt, if you were a soldier in the Nazi army, you had to wear a buckle that said, Gott mit uns, the German for God, on our side. Uh, like every other form of totalitarianism and fanaticism, this is religious in itself, and it was not, it was not as it was in some other countries, the Christian right in power, but it was the Christian right subsumed into a party that involved various other terrible mutations too. So I just have to defend myself, it seems to me, on these two uh, matters. I'll close on the implied question that Bill asked me earlier. Why don't you accept this wonderful offer? <clears throat> Why wouldn't you like to meet Shakespeare, for example? I mean, I don't know if you really think that when you die you can be corporeally reassembled and have conversations with authors from previous epochs. It's not necessary that you believe that in Christian theology, and I have to say it sounds like a complete fairy tale to me. The only reason I want to meet Shakespeare, or might even want to, is because I can meet him any time, because he is immortal in the works he's left behind. If you've read those, meeting the author would almost certainly be a disappointment. But when Socrates was sentenced to death for his philosophical investigations and for blasphemy, for challenging the gods of the city, and he accepted his death, he did say, well, if we are lucky, perhaps I'll be able to hold conversation with other great thinkers and philosophers and doubters too. In other words, that the discussion about what is good, what is beautiful, what is noble, what is pure and what is true could always go on. Why is that important? Why would I like to do that? Because that's the only conversation worth having. And whether it goes on or not after I die, I don't know. But I do know that it's the conversation I want to have while I'm still alive, which means that to me, the offer of certainty, the offer of complete security, the offer of an impermeable faith that can't give way is an offer of something not worth having. I want to live my life taking the risk all the time that I don't know anything like enough yet, that I haven't understood enough, that I can't know enough, that I'm always hungrily operating on the, on the margins of, of a potentially great harvest of future knowledge and wisdom. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'd urge you to look at those of you who tell you, those people who tell you at your age that you're dead till you believe as they do. What a terrible thing to be telling to children. And that you can only live. And that you can only live by accepting an absolute authority. Don't think of that as a gift. Think of, it as a, think of it as a poison chalice. Push it aside, however tempting it is. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Thank you. Thank both of our guests, Dr. Dembski, Mr. Hitchens. Thank you. Yes, yes. Where was I before? Oh, you're, you're 80%. Yeah.